So, uh, hi, my name is Paul Rosler. I teach political science here at St. Charles Community College. Um, and my colleagues, uh, Kate Weber and Dana Pruitt, are gonna talk about abortion, privacy, uh, birth control, uh, all kinds of interesting concepts and how they all interrelate. Uh, Kate Weber is a professor of history here at, at, uh, at the community college, and she's gonna talk about the kind of the history of birth control and abortion, and uh, Dana uh, is gonna talk about, Dana Pruitt, sorry, I drew a blank on your last name for a second. <laughs> I do that, when you get older, you do that. Uh, Dana Pruitt is gonna talk about the sociological aspect of it, the implications for, uh, implications of abortion, what it means or doesn't mean so from a sociological perspective. But uh, we thought it made sense for the historian to go first, so please lead us off. Hello. So one of the things I really wanted to start off with was to correct a misperception that the Supreme Court decision made and helped to inform um, Justice Alito's opinion. It was the idea that there is no history and tradition of legal abortion in the United States. Mr. Alito is not a historian, and there is actually an active scholarship that discusses this history of legal abortion. Women have been practicing abortion for thousands of years, and in the United States, they practiced it legally until some of the first laws started getting passed in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. And these laws were not passed for medical reasons per se. They were often passed because doctors were trying to build up their practices. The 1830s is when the AMA starts to form the American Medical Association. And at the time, it's mostly midwives who take care of the reproductive health of women. And um, the doctors, medicine doesn't have the kind of history that you would expect. Back in the day, if you were a person who was trying to get your sons educated, if you had a smart son, you'd help him go to law school, or you'd send him into business, or maybe the pastorate. Uh, if you had a son who was adult, you sent him to medical school. Um, that was because it took almost no education to become a doctor up until about the Flexner Report <laughs> of the early 20th century. Um, so doctors, as you might not be surprised, had a hard time getting enough business to go around, especially when most of what they have to offer is bloodletting and um, bone setting. So they're hoping if they can help deliver a woman's child, they can convince her family to call him back out. Um, I think there's also a certain amount of gendered power in this as well, trying to get control of childbirth from midwives who are mostly women. There's a huge healthcare downside to this, however. Once women have to get um, men to attend them in childbirth, many of these men have only attended one live birth before they become doctors. <laughs> Medical school, unless you go to one of the best ones in the United States at the time, or go to Europe where they have even better ones earlier on, um, you sit through a series of lectures for a year, and then you go back for another year, and then you're a doctor. That's it. Some doctors only proceed, per, um, go over a childbirth in which a wooden mannequin, um, they deliver a wooden mannequin of her baby. And so you could understand that these births become fairly dangerous. <laughs> um, midwives have better um, mortality rates and less infection than doctors basically until the 1950s. Um, <laughs> so abortion in part is, is part of this si switch where doctors are trying to gain control of the childbirth rooms from midwives. Um, so women had several decades of legal abortion after the um, Constitution was passed. Often men didn't talk about these things. There is not a lot of case law, there is some, um, because this was thought to be the moral property of women, something that was women's business that men didn't really need to discuss. Even um, a lot of people's religious beliefs understood that abortion was all right before quickening. Quickening was a period when women first felt, uh, a time when women first felt the fetal movement in their womb, and it was believed that that was when the soul was entering the body of the fetus. And so um, in the much of the 19th century, many people's popular understanding of abortion 
revolved around this quickening idea, and quickening is usually about four months in. And so for a long time, abortion before quickening was legal, and even after it started to be made illegal throughout the middle of the 19th century, after quickening, abortion was seen as morally sound. Um, in the middle of the 19th century, when it started to be illegal in many more places, um, the women who relied on abortion more often tended to be married with and already have children. Um, this is something most people don't expect. It's often seen as something that women resort to if they have um, an unplanned pregnancy outside of marriage. But by the 1860s, women wanted smaller families. And because there was not a lot of reliable birth control at the time, women often relied on abortion to keep their family sizes manageable. And again, um, men often viewed this as women's um, moral property, women's field. Um, although there was some prosecution of doctors, especially if women died, or if they made too many, um, made too much money. Like Madame Restell, a New York abortionist, who, um, with her German immigrant husband, had been a political radical, and they created a couple of um, private hospitals where they would see women. Um, one was very well paying and private, and one was um, a little less paying for poor women in New York who might want to access abortion. She later died after Anthony Comstock, an anti-abortion, anti-birth control crusader, helped to take her to trial. Um, so one of the big shifts that affects abortion um, and abortion law in the 19th century is Comstock. Um, Anthony Comstock serves in the Civil War, and when he does, he um, sees his fellow soldiers drinking and gambling and looking at pornography, and he believes that it's leading them astray and making, them, uh, making their lives dissipated. So he decides that he needs to restrict people's access to obscene, obscene material after the war, and he starts encouraging different states to pass laws, including his home state of New York, um, that outlaws the passage of obscene materials through the mail. Now, how does this have a birth control and abortion impact? Well. He redefines obscene in this new law as any medical information, including medical information about reproduction. So even if you want to know how your period works, that information is considered obscene. Not that that knowledge would have helped you with birth control all that much up until about 1913. Doctors did not know how women ovulated <laughs> up until about 1913. Um, they thought that women were very much like dogs that they were having their period um, and their ovulation right around the same time. And so they often encouraged women who didn't want to have babies to, uh, to not conceive babies, to um, have sex at the period that we know today is the most fertile period of your monthly cycle. So how, let's take us back to abortion. Um, legal abortion was actually around even after it was made illegal for quite some time. This is because people got a lot of tuberculosis and other infections that could kill you if you had, um, if you were pregnant and went into labor. So there were a lot of doctors who performed abortions because, uh, legal abortions, because it helped women survive. Um, this lasts throughout much of the 19th and early 20th centuries until, um, until uh, antibiotics are widely available. In the 1950s, you see this shift substantially, and it really puts a lot of pressure on women and abortion. In the 1950s, um, because you have mass-produced uh, penicillin, for example, many of these illnesses can be cured. Um, rather than having to have an abortion to survive, you can, um, you can take penicillin and have your baby. The problem with... Um, well, problem. The difficulty of that, even before this era, was that generally it was middle class women and rich women who had the most access. Even poor women still had difficulty. But what happens in the 50s is now doctors can't just say, hey, it's for her health, we're giving her a legal abortion. Hospital committees were created that had to sign off on whether or not um, your, the abortion you wanted to give was legal. And women had to go in front of committees and answer questions about their health and their need for an abortion. This meant that in the 1950s, much fewer legal abortions were available. And this complicated even further when there was a German measles outbreak in the 1960s. Um, the German measles is very bad for fetal development, especially at certain weeks. 
um, and a number of women um, began to give birth to children with um, a lot of medical difficulties, some of which didn't survive and some of which faced life lifelong um, disabilities because of the German measles. Um, and this got a lot more people interested in abortion. Um, not all of the women who had German measles when they were pregnant were able to gain access to an abortion and some of them felt that this was necessary. This was helped further along by thalidomide. Um, thalidomide was a medication that um, is still useful for some things, but during that time period, people realized that it could make you feel better when you had lots of morning sickness. Um, it was never legally available during the, in the United States for that cause, but some men who served abroad um, or who had business contacts abroad brought home thalidomide for their w pregnant wives. And Sherry Finkbein was one of these women who took thalidomide while she was pregnant. Um, babies who were born after their mothers took thalidomide um, often were missing limbs, um, had severe um, difficulties, some of them surviving, um, and this was something Sherry Finkbein was concerned about. She was going to be granted in the early 60s a private abortion, but as soon as she spoke out about it to encourage other women not to take thalidomide and not risk this problem, the hospital rescinded their permission. And so she had to go to Sweden to get her abortion. Um, these put pressure on the legal rights of abortion movement in the 1960s. Um, and throughout the 1960s, um, you still had some limited access to birth control. It wasn't until 1965 that women had legal a legal right to birth control, and then it was only married women. That's under the court case Griswold versus Connecticut, which I believe Paul's going to be talking about a little bit later. Um, Griswold versus Connecticut said that it's within the privacy rights of a couple to decide whether or not and when they want to have children, and so they should be able to have access to legal birth control. There had been a um, 1930s case called the U.S. versus One Package that um, allowed for doctors to prescribe birth control when they thought it was medically necessary, but that was a little bit of legal shaky ground. This Griswold um, bill, I mean, this Griswold decision was much more universal, and it applied in all 50 states right away in 1965. That privacy right did not extend to um, single women until 1971 when Einstadt versus Baird was decided. And it decided that you didn't need to be married to have privacy rights that allow you to make choices about birth control and abortion and when you want to have children or if. Um, these ideas of privacy rights have often been seen as also connecting to decisions about things like whether or not you want to get married, who you want to marry, and also, in some ways, freedom of movement, the ability to travel, to go between states. Um, and so this, and, and also the decision to have sex and who you want to have sex with and what kind of sexual acts are legal. These will all play a role, too, in privacy. When we start striking down privacy rules, it can really, it can really impact a lot of decisions we have on, in our lives. Um, so in 1973, um, Roe versus Wade built further on this privacy um, and said that women should have the access to make this decision and have an abortion before the end, um, before the end of the second trimester. Over time, it has been shifted to discuss um, and to change to viability, which is slightly earlier than the end of the second trimester. Um, but since 1973, women did have a legal right to access abortion at that point. Um, in 1978, the Hyde Amendment passed, which restricted women's ability to use federal funds to get an abortion. This already starts making it more difficult for poor women to access abortion um, than which rich women and uh, middle class women. Um, all of this in part comes out of a women's rights movement, and women's rights activism does support this. Um, you t also see various groups who had violated laws and um, who had taken action to try to assist women while abortion was not legal. Two of them are kind of particularly interesting. One of them is the Janes, who operated out of Chicago in the 1960s and early 70s. There's an HBO Max um, documentary on them if you're interested in taking a look at it. There's also a book. Um, but the Janes, they were anonymous women who um, were tired of hearing about women who were not being able to find affordable and safe abortions. and so. 
excuse me, they found a man who they believed was a medical professional to offer them, and he, they discovered he wasn't. Um, and then they learned how to do it themselves, because if he could do safe abortions, why not them? And so they made abortion much more affordable. They had an anonymous phone line that you could call into. And because a lot of the police also wanted, and wealthy people in Chicago wanted their ladies to have access to abortion, what happened is that mostly they didn't face a lot of, of charges. Um, they just had to kind of be careful. And every once in a while, um, there might be a clamp down where they had to um, concern themselves a little bit with the law. Um, over time, another group also formed in 1967 in New York. Um, most of us think of abortion as being something that um, most religious people are against, but that's also not, not true. Um, not all Christians are anti-abortion, and um, the Jewish faith also embraces the idea that it's a woman's health first. <laughs> um, but the clergy consultation service was a group of clergy, both Jewish and Christian, who came together to find women abortion access from 1967 until it was made legal in 1973. Um, you could call and you were supposed to make an appointment with a clergy member where they would um, counsel you. And if you were determined that abortion was something you needed, they had a um, list of reliable abortion providers who they would help you access. Um, and they also did like client surveys. They would go in and they would ask women how their experience was. Were they treated respectfully? They would send women um, and, uh, to go in and look at the facilities and see how clean things were. So if they found someone who was not very um, kind, someone who was a bit of a huckster, someone who charged more than he claimed that he was going to, they could cut, off, cut him off and make sure that they had reliable, affordable, respectful people on their list. Um, and it was... Um, pastors, priests, and rabbis who provided this service for um, a number of years. But it's not entirely clear how many they g helped um, gain access to. I mean, some type, in some cases, they also provided women. Um, I mean, uh, Mexico was one place they sent women. And after abortion was made legal in Hawaii in 70 and um, in New York in 71, I think, um, they would help women from out of state come in. They had someone meet them at the airport and help them find a place to live, so, or to stay while they were there. Uh, although they had it so worked out that they could often send women on, this, uh, on a flight home the same day. Um, and they would talk to the stewardesses to make sure they kept an eye on those women as they took their flights and gave them symptoms to look out for to make sure that they were all right on the way home. Um, so there was a lot of organization around this, and that's not something that most of us usually think of. Um, they have a little, there's a book that came out on them a few years ago um, as well. They're pretty, they're, they're fascinating, but they didn't keep records um, for probably obvious reasons. <laughs> um, they were afraid those records would get discovered by the government. Um, but it is estimated that they helped about 450,000 women gain access to abortion. Um, so uh, since the 1970s, we've increasingly restricted, um, there are, our government re increasingly restricted abortion rights, starting with the Hyde Amendment in 76, which I ar already mentioned. There has been violence against abortion clinics um, and, abor and doctors who perform abortions. There have been 11 murders, 17 attempted murders, 383 death threats, 153 assaults, um, 373 invasions, um, 41 bombings, 655 anthrax threats, 33 kidnappings, 41 I have bombings twice, um, and 173 arsons, um, and a lot of vandalism. Um, these um, have, those increased in the 1980s and 90s, and um, eventually um, ha has, has resulted in a, like I said, a, at least 11 deaths. Um, so there have been increasing inst restrictions on abortion rights as well. Um, in which there have been parental consent laws, parental notification laws, um, state-directed counseling requirements, um, a, a re required waiting period before m abortion was made illegal in Missouri. We had one of the longest waiting periods in the country of three days. Um, 20 states um, used to prohibit abortion after viability unless life or health is at risk, and 29 states to prohibit Medicaid funding of abortion unless life is at risk or rape or incest. Um, Missouri's law today um, is, um, 
has exceptions for the life and the health of the mother, but this too is troubling and has a troubling history. Um, and inter some interesting evidence to examine is how Catholic hospitals have dealt with abortion and the exception for life of the mother or health of the mother. Even though many state policies that limit abortion um, say that you can have an exception for the life or the health of a mother, we have women before these policies changed dying in Catholic hospitals or sometimes being gravely injured in Catholic hospitals um, because the hospitals themselves interpreted the rules that you could have an abortion but only to protect the life and the health of the mother. They often refused to act on them until the women were at death's door um, or until a fetus no longer had a heartbeat. Ireland changed their abortion laws a couple years ago after one woman died in such a situation. Um, there was a lawsuit a few years back in which they found that about six women in a Catholic hospital system in, in the United States um, found themselves disabled or gravely injured because of having to wait while they got infected and septic for many hours and sometimes days before they were offered abortion services. Um, when questioned, the um, bishops' councils who who take um, care of these policies said that there is an access to abortion um, if you have life uh, or health of the mother at risk. And why this is so important is we've already seen in cases like ectopic pregnancies, um, since these restrictions have passed, women are already becoming gravely ill before they're gaining access to abortion, even though their lives are at risk and their healths are at risk. And if your doctor is spending time on the phone with a lawyer to try to get permission to um, perform a, a service, you're much less likely to get good health care. You're more likely to get infected. You're more likely to bleed out. Um, you're more likely to ha have to take a lo lot longer to recover if you do live. Um, so there is a long history of abortion in the United States. And a lot of this history has often allowed women to gain access to abortion when their lives or their health is at risk. Um, and some of it has been based around privacy. Now, one key moment before I move on to allow you to talk is um, privacy perhaps is not the best argument. Ruth Bader Ginsburg herself argued for a different um, standard. She wanted to use it on um, kind of an equal rights standard. Um, she had a case that was about to go before the Supreme Court in 1972. Um, that case revolved around Susan Strecker. Um, she was uh, a member of the U.S. military. She was an army nurse, and she got pregnant while she was serving. And during her service, um, there was a policy that women who got pregnant while they were in the army had to either get an abortion or had to lose their jobs. And th several thousand women um, were kicked out of the army because of their pregnancies. She did not think that this was a fair policy. She kept her pregnancy secret for seven and a half months, found a family that she was friends with who wanted to adopt her child, and as soon as it was discovered that she was pregnant, she was told she would have to leave or she would have to, I think she was past seven and a half months, she couldn't get an abortion at that point. She sued the U.S. government, and in, um, this took several years to wind its way through the court system. Um, eventually, because abortion was made legal and the, the government's um, case was very bad with her, um, they, the case did not go before the Supreme Court, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg's um, argument in that case was going to be um, that a woman has a right to have a child. And she felt that this would be a strong um, legal statute that would allow women who didn't want to have children also to have that flip side right. Um, and she felt that this was a much stronger legal basis than the right to privacy. Um, so yes, we have a rich legal history of both legal accessible abortions and increasing restrictions over them um, since this case came out, um, was decided this year in June of 24, June 24th. Um, anyway, um, I should let y'all take over. I'm a smidge taller than Kate. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> so welcome. I usually, uh, those who have, my, have me in poli-sci classes, I usually start my lectures with a short clip. So I've got one here, I think. Oh, oh so oh, wait, by the way, you, she's kind of given it away. Uh, what do, what do uh, birth control, abortion, and gay marriage have in common? Anyone know? Government people? 
Someone mentioned the right to privacy. They're all covered on the right to privacy, yes. So that's what we'll kind of talk about that right in this lecture. Um, the history of it, what's going, to, what's going to happen now with the Dobbs decision. But first, a clip. Maybe. Oops. Maybe not. Oops. Oh, Nick's not here, so there's no audio. See if I can. have audio. Um, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Do you have audio? Is it coming through now? The joys of technology. Okay, so never mind. No audio clip. That's fine. Uh, the, the video. So basically this clip talks about some of the history and some of the criticisms and some of the concerns that are raised in this Dobbs decision. Um, and, and, the, the, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of touch on it. So what is the right to privacy based on? Um, as Kate mentioned, um, the, the Supreme Court established the right to privacy in 1965. Um, Griswold v. Connecticut, it was a, a married couple, and, and Estelle Griswold was a director of Planned Parenthood, and she prescribed them birth control, and that was a crime. And, and so basically the question is, can you criminalize birth control. And the Supreme Court made it all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said no. States may not criminalize. And specifically, they actually did say with regard to married couples at the time, and, but, but the general, this is the first time there was a, the court acknowledged a right to privacy. And um, basically, the, the um, I've got to put my little timer on, I forgot to do that. Um, so the, the idea here is that there are shadows, there are zones, penumbras of privacy throughout the Bill of Rights. If you're familiar with the Bill of Rights, you have the Third Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the government can't uh, uh, go into your house, the government cannot, they have to have a search warrant, the government, uh, you, know, you, have, you have these certain protections, these certain rights. And what the courts have ruled is that those rights, those, those zones of privacy are found throughout the Bill of Rights, and here's the, here's the rub, the Ninth Amendment is the key and it says that the Bill of Rights lists all the rights you have in, in the Constitution. Great, but that's not all the rights you have, okay? Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion, blah, 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 blah. But the Ninth Amendment says just because we listed all the rights you have doesn't mean there aren't others out there. The enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And so the Supreme Court used this idea that these zones of privacy to say that there is now a right to privacy established in the Constitution. It's there, even though it's not spelled out. As we just pointed out from Kate, um, the right to privacy was expanded in Roe v. Wade in 1973. Um, basically, the court here guaranteed that there is bodily, uh, the right to privacy guaranteed bodily autonomy. Um, and as if you, I don't know if you saw um, the Washington Professor Majerian here earlier, he did a really nice summation of it. Um, essentially, Roe v. Wade was broken into trimesters. Uh, the first trimester, the woman's right was essentially sacrosanct, and then, and then as it got later on, the courts ruled that the, the state had a legitimate right to protect the, the fetus. So as further along in pregnancy, and as, as Kate absolutely fantastically said, it, later on, uh, in the Planned Parenthood decision, said that it was uh, viability, which is mid-20 weeks and something like 24 weeks, something like that, typically, that the, the woman no longer has a right to have an abortion, with exceptions for health or life of the mother. And that's what's a really important distinction here, is that it was also health or life of the mother in these decisions. So a woman's physical health could also be a justification to have an abortion. There was some debate whether it covered mental health or not, um, but certainly her, her physical health was guaranteed. You didn't have to wait till it was a life-saving issue. And I'm, I'm gonna, the reason why I'm saying that is because of Missouri law now. Um, so the, the, in 1992, there was an important court case. Everyone thought, is Roe gonna be turned over? Because again, by this point, I'll talk about this later, there's, there's a red-blue, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative divide on the right to privacy. Generally, conservatives don't like the right to privacy. 
the Casey decision was a conservative court. And so people thought, Roe's over, it's over. But in a shocker, the Republican-led conservative court ruled that there is still a right to an abortion. And it emphasized, again, personal autonomy. Okay, so now, it, it, it allowed states to regulate that more. And so since, as you, Kate pointed out, over the last 30 years or so, you've seen a lot more regulations on, on what women could or could not do in very, very many states. But this, the concept, the, the idea that there is a right to have an abortion is still fundamental to the Constitution according to the Casey decision. There was also a, a minor decision in Pennsylvania. This wasn't a Supreme Court decision, but I thought was really interesting um, uh, in the Schimp decision which uh, you cannot argue, you cannot force someone to undergo a medical treatment. And again, it's a small local, it was a regional court, um, but the judge based his decision. It, was, it had to do with a, a cousin. I guess they didn't like each other. Um, a cousin had a, uh, 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 I forgot even what disease it was. Um, I might even say on there. Um, and I think he was a coal miner or something, or was some kind of a miner, and he had a horrible disease and he needed a bone marrow transplant. And, and his cousin was a perfect match. And he said, hey, cuz, I need your bone marrow to survive. And the cousin said, no, I'm not going to give it to you. Went all the way, the, he said, no, you have to give it to me. It's for my life. You, you're going to save my life. You're going to give your bone marrow to save my life. And the, Supreme, and the judge ruled in this, based on the Supreme Court ruling of Roe v. Wade, that no, you have personal bodily autonomy and cannot, you cannot be forced to be an organ donor, to be a blood donor, to be a, a bone marrow donor. So very interesting, you know, so based again on Roe v. Wade's personal autonomy. Um, anyone know what year it became a crime, it is no longer a crime to have gay sex in Texas? No. Um, no, there was actually a Georgia ruling in which the Supreme Court said it was okay to ban gay sex. 1986 um, was, a, was, a, was, a, it was really kind of a, a, a wild ruling. I couldn't believe it when, I, when, the, when I was alive and around in 86, and I was like, what? The Supreme Court said you could still put people in jail from gay sex in 1986? Uh, the Georgia decision. When was it finally banned? 2003. Lawrence versus Texas in 2003, the Supreme Court ruled that you may not arrest somebody for engaging in homosexual sex. 2003. How many were born since 2003? Okay, <laughs> so it's, been, it's not been that long ago that it's, it's, it is no longer a crime to put someone in jail for having gay sex. That's how long, that's, it was 2003, 19 years ago. Um, pretty shocking. So, so what the court ruled is the right to privacy established in Griswold, expanded in Roe, now applies to homosexual sex. So it's not just birth control, it's not just abortion, but it's also the right to have gay sex. And then along comes this year. Okay, we knew this, um, we knew this case was coming and we knew the makeup of the court and so we kind of assumed uh, you know, we actually had to decide what our, what our panel is going to talk about in April and uh, so before the June ruling, so we kind of knew it was going to happen. So let's, let's, have a, uh, let's have a panel on, on the right to abortion because whatever the court's going to rule, it's going to be interesting. And so uh, it just happened. And the really interesting thing, and this uh, ties directly with what Kate was saying, is the quote from this ruling, the right to abortion is not deeply rooted in nation's history and tradition. Well, and they actually incorrectly stated that abortion was illegal when, when you clearly, I mean, they're just completely, the Supreme Court decision was, was wrong, completely wrong about history of abortion in America. But the argument that he makes is that it was not deeply rooted in tradition, in history and tradition. And therefore, the Supreme Court, in, after 49 years, ruled that Roe and then Casey were, were um, no longer valid. They overturned those previous decisions and ended the right to an abortion. So states today, thanks to the Dobbs versus decision, Jackson Women's Health, um, states can indeed force women to carry a child to term, even if they don't want to. Even if there's a case, the video is gonna talk about, there was a case of um, 
uh, as it was the as Indiana. Girl? What? The in your, Indiana. Girl in Ohio. Uh, right, but I think that the abortion was in. The abortion was in Indiana because it's still right. legal there. So there was a ten-year-old girl that was raped in Ohio, um, and she couldn't get an abortion in Ohio because it was illegal in Ohio. Um, and people, you know, people in the media say, "Oh, it's made up story." And finally, the doctor in the video that we didn't show you was the doctor who actually performed the abortion, talking about it, saying, "Yeah, it happened. It was real." And this is this is a real problem, um, and and this and, and the concerns there are real about about this. Um, what's going to happen now? So this divide really is a red versus blue divide. This is a liberal versus conservative divide in America. Um, we knew it was going to be a, the, the 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 outcome was almost for certain because we knew who there were six conservative judges and three liberal judges, six to three. Duh, it's going to be a, it's going to be an easy ruling overturning Roe v. Wade. Um, all th but it was interesting because it, you're seeing a much more politicization. You didn't used to see that 30, 40, 50 years ago. Even right, in 1992, 30 years ago, it was a conservative court, but they voted to uphold Roe v. Wade. So what you see now in America since this decision is a, a split. I don't need to go back. Yeah, is a split among generally conservative states banning abortion, you see, you see the red states are total bans. You see uh, um, some 15 or 18 or 20 week bans um, uh, later on. And then of course, you have states where abortion is clearly constitutionally protected in those states, guaranteed in those states. Again, you tend to see them as more liberal states. So you see a liberal conservative divide there in the United States. What's interesting, what this video was gonna talk a little bit about, um, but it actually touches on again what Kate talked about is that this ban on abortion, I mean, a, a, to a large extent, abortion is health care. There is sometimes, there are, you know, there are times when you need to have an abortion. Um, so the, the Missouri law, women have to have an, have to carry the fetus to term, have to carry the baby to term, even if there is physical or emotional harm to their person. Um, the Missouri law is very specific. It says it is an abortion ban with the exception to save the life of the mother. But the doctor must prove it. The, the, the burden of responsibility is on the doctor to prove that the woman's life is in danger. <laughs> All right. So, so the doctor, if the jury disagrees with the doctor or a prosecutor disagrees with the doctor, he can put him on trial and he can go to prison. If the doctor thinks this is going to save your life, but the jury disagrees. Well, what's, what's the danger of that? What's, what's, what possible harm could happen if, if a doctor is too afraid to perform an abortion on a woman who's sick? This is what could happen. In Ireland, you mentioned this earlier, Ireland, a few years ago, um, the, the, the doctor was terrified. The doctor was like, we're going to wait a little longer until you're for sure your life is in danger because we're not sure, yeah, the fetuses are going to survive, but we think... If you, I think we can, you can hold on a little longer, then we can definitely say your life is in danger, and then we can give an abortion for you. That's the Missouri standard, right? You gotta hold on, just hold on a little longer, and then until your life is really in danger. Well, what do you think happened? They waited a little too long, and then she was dead, okay? There was a case in Michigan over the summer where the same kind of thing happened. Uh, there was a Texas law, okay? The doctors were, were, were on, she, she needed to have, she, her water broke. She was no way, it was like 20 weeks, 22 weeks, I forgot what it was, but it was, you know, no way the fetus was viable, but it still had a heartbeat, and Texas had a heartbeat law, so if you got a heartbeat, you can't have an abortion. So she was literally dying on the table, and, and they said, you've got, you've got to be closer to death before we can actually perform the abortion. And so they, luckily, they did save her life, um, but they had to wait till she was close enough to death, the doctor wouldn't feel he could go to prison. So they can make a case that it was no longer, uh, that, the, yeah, that sort of if a jury comes up and says, hey, you know, was it really save her life? Well, look, she, look how close she was to death. And so this case, the doctor is not, no chance of the doctor going to jail because they waited till she damn near died. Um, and then they give her an abortion. So that's the problem with health, with this, with these laws. By the way, pregnancies can mess with women. I'm not a woman, okay? But it's, it is, Hundreds of people die each year. Uh, Kate mentioned that earlier. Um, 40,000 uh, each year have severe complications, hemorrhage, organ failure, other significant complications. 
Um, 20 percent of women have permanent incontinence um, so, and who actually give vaginal birth. Um, you have cardiovascular and metabolic diseases later on in life. You have, you have a risk of that. So what's, you know, so you are forcing women who don't want to have a baby to have these permanent lifetime issues to deal with. So, that, I mean, so my, my issue here is question is bodily autonomy. Kind of, that's kind of where I'm coming from. From a bodily autonomy perspective, this is, this is crazy to me. But that is what the court has ruled, that the woman has no right to bodily autonomy once she is pregnant. However, other freedoms are also threatened. Besides, they don't just affect women. Um, we talked about uh, gay sex. We talked about gay, you know, gay marriage, birth control, interracial marriage. Um, remember, the court said that the right to abortion is not deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition, and therefore, it doesn't exist. Is the right to interracial marriage deeply rooted in Americans' uh, history and tradition? Is gay marriage, is any of these rights, birth control? Women no. voting. What, say again? Women voting. Well, we have, there's a constitutional amendment that guarantees that, <laughs> so you can't, you, you, we have that at least, so that's yes. not going to go away. Um, but so that's the thing that's so interesting about this decision. And, and Thomas is very clear. It was actually five, it was actually six Republican, very hard, hard right conservative judges. Um, uh, Thomas actually wrote a separate opinion because he actually argued that absolutely these other rights got to go. Birth control out the window. Uh, gay marriage, gay sex out the window. So he's actually advocating. He's a member of the court advocating these have got to go. So... What's going to happen after now? So you, you see some privacy, privacy battles. You've got um, the, the, you know, the House, the U.S. House, passed a, a right to birth control, guaranteed constitutional right, a uh, House right, uh, a law, legal right to birth, but not constitutional right. By the way, uh, my time's almost up. A, a legal right is different than a constitutional right. A legal right, you can change the law, and boom, you can change it. It's gone. So a constitutional right is in the Constitution. You can't do that. Um, Republicans just announced, the uh, Republican Texas Attorney General just announced plans to criminalize sodomy, gay sex, and same-sex marriage in Texas, ba going off on Thomas's idea that we're going to ban that again. So he's, uh, he's running for re-election on the premise of promise to actually ban gay sex again in Texas. So what's next? Um, right to privacy is not guaranteed. It is, not, it is no longer a right that's going to be guaranteed. Uh, it'll play out in states. It'll play out in Congress. Uh, I always like to talk about politics, who gets what, when, and how, Harold Laswell. It's about choices over values. What do you care about? What are your values? Um, should the government be able to restrict bodily autonomy, birth control, abortion, gay marriage, organ donation, for that matter? Vote. So my last comment there. Sorry, I'm making the pitch there. You know, make your, whatever your values are. I don't, you can disagree with me. That's fine. What's fine about politics, is, a lot of stuff is opinion. Disagree with me. But vote. Make your voice heard. You can register to vote right outside here. Easy peasy, takes you two minutes to do it. So go ahead and do that. Um, and whatever you feel about this, make sure you're heard. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, Dana now. <laughs> like by a foot or so, so let me, give me a second. <laughs> okay, Go, that's better. I probably should have stayed seated because that's a little closer to my height, but we're going to make that work. All right, um, I am Dana Pruitt. I teach sociology here at SDC. I'm going to be talking a bit about um, the more sort of present day landscape and what we know uh, based on contemporary research about abortion. Um, but I'm very much going to be approaching this as a sociologist. So as I am on a panel with other social scientists, and because oftentimes people aren't quite sure what sociology is, I'm actually going to start off talking a little bit about what that means for me as a sociologist, because there are going to be several things you'll notice that I'll touch on at various points in the presentation. 
Now, as a sociologist, our ultimate interest when it comes to understanding why people do what it is they do in our social world is to understand the influence that society has on people. There are various ways that society impacts us, and therefore, as sociologists, there are different levels of society that we consider and understand. That comes to bear with any sort of social um, behavior that we study, but that is especially the case for something as complex and complicated as abortion. So I will be speaking a little bit um, to a more individual level consideration, which is in consideration um, of people's circumstances. We also consider uh, the role that social systems that help pro propel our society and keep it going, how those systems operate independently, but also how they coexist, and in turn, how they impact us as people. And then as social beings, we are routinely making sense of what's going on in the society around us. So I'm going to be speaking a little bit um, to broader ideas about abortion uh, and how things may be impacted, because that's very important to how we make sense of society, but also therefore what we do, what we regard as options and the like. Now, before I talk a little bit about what makes it a bit difficult to study um, abortion from a social scientific perspective, um, something that I just want to briefly mention is that uh, while I'll be talking about the reasons that research sites for uh, why people obtain abortions, it is incredibly important regardless of where one may fall politically to be aware of the reasons and the outcomes. Um, no matter what sort of direction to which you may be committed, there are ways that knowing that information um, is useful and incredibly important, especially in the interest of broader health care and the changes that are likely to emerge from it, um, regardless, um, or I should say regardless of one's leanings, but also given um, the changes that have taken place. So that being said, as I talk a little bit um, about abortion rates, there are some things that I want to make very um, known about what we know about abortion, especially from a more social scientific standpoint. I will be talking about some social scientific research. I'll also be talking a bit about more biomedical research. Um, one of the things that can make it incredibly hard to think about it as a social scientist is the fact that there is a stigma around um, obtaining an abortion and that can make it very hard to get people to tell researchers about it um, when they are conducting studies. That can sometimes be a significant challenge. There are also challenges in terms of what information ends up being reported. I'll talk quite a bit about the CDC and the Guttmacher Institute. They get information in a couple of different ways. Um, the CDC requests information um, from the central organizing health agencies of a state. That means that they will contact, for instance, the Department of Health of Missouri to ask for numbers uh, on abortion statistics. Not all states report, so there will be times where there will be a little bit of incomplete information, but that is the nature um, of research on the topic, and I just want to be very transparent about that. There are also just some things that we do not know because people may seek abortions through alternative means. Um, there's not really a way to truly know how many people uh, may solicit something like, um, if I always stumble over this word, um, if a pristone, um, or to use other home-based remedies in order to um, go through with uh, obtaining an abortion outside of going to a clinic um, and going through those legal means. So all of that said, what do we know? Well, one thing we do know is that we've seen a significant decrease over time, um, especially from the 90s in the rate of abortion, no matter what reporting entity um, we examine, whether it's from the Guttmacher Institute or the CDC, we've seen a pretty sharp decline uh, over time. Now, while there has been a decline over time, there are some important demographic characteristics of folks who obtain abortion that it's important to highlight. Um, when it comes to age, it is most common uh, among women who are in their 20s. The age range is 20 to 24, have been consistently uh, the uh, age group that has obtained the highest uh, rate of abortions, and uh, 25, followed by uh, ages 25 to 29. Following that is ages 30 to 34. So while this is a reflection um, of people who may uh, become pregnant of all ages, um, you know, within um, a range of being able to become pregnant, uh, what we see is that it is something that uh, among, we see especially among like younger adult women. Now, when it comes to abortion across income, this is an especially important one because it gives us a way to understand how circumstances play an important role. 
Now, there, is some, there are some mixed findings here, so I'm going to say put a pin uh, in what I mention. Uh, but based on the numbers from the Guttmacher Institute, um, about half of the women uh, who obtain abortions are below the federal poverty level. And just to give you a sense of what that means in terms of income uh, for an individual, the federal poverty line in 2022 is about $13,590. So uh, folks who are at or below that income for a sort of single individual household or for two people, uh, about $18,310 just to give you a sense of what we mean when we're talking about at or below uh, poverty level, depending on the size of the household. So the Guttmacher Institute finds that uh, many of the folks obtaining abortions are lower income. Um, and the reasons why that is the case yield some pretty important findings. Uh, what's not happening is that people are having different levels of sexual activity across income. Across different income categories, whether we are talking about folks who are below or at the poverty line uh, or are uh, one to two times the poverty level, two to three times, three to four times, or four times or more the federal poverty line, there's some similar um, percentages in terms of having sexual activity. Uh, so what's driving that pattern is not necessarily um, vast differences in terms of the amount of sex that people are having. What uh, research instead notes is that when it comes to income differences, contraception plays an incredibly important role. Um, a 2015 Brookings study actually found a higher rate um, of abortion among uh, higher income women and cited that it is more likely that lower income women may become unintentionally pregnant and that which they then connected to uh, access to contraception. So when it comes to those demographics and those patterns, there are some very, very important things that we can discover about circumstances and how those matter uh, in understanding why um, people obtain an abortion. But there are other factors that research routinely cites as well. Um, some of what I'll mention is, most, is specific to the US. Some of it is more global in nature. When it comes to uh, one of the most widely mentioned um, reasons, economic concerns routinely emerge as a common reason for seeking uh, an abortion. And that is something that is the case in the US. That is also something that is the case globally. Another one that is incredibly popular is concerns about one's relationship or having partner support. Um, people who report that they are unsure whether or not their partner will be supportive um, yielded like, more likelihood to seek an abortion, and that also included people who, were, uh, who had concerns about being in an abusive relationship. Um, one that came up uh, particularly among uh, women who are a bit older and already had children was the ability to care for additional children. And that was reflected in a monetary sense, in an economic sense, but that's also something that is reflected in the ability to provide like the intangible stuff uh, that they felt like their kids needed, whether or not there would be enough time to go around, whether or not there would be enough sort of internal, like personal resources uh, to be able to parent. Uh, more common among folks who did not already have children was apprehensions about readiness to parent. Um, that was a commonly cited one and often tended to be the case among uh, younger folks who expressed uh, apprehension about whether or not they were ready to become a parent, as were challenges in educational progress um, or the ability uh, to work around a very sort of changed lifestyle or schedule. Now, when it comes to outcomes, I'm going to be talking a little bit about outcomes in a couple of different senses. Um, a lot of what I'm going to draw from is from a longitudinal study called the Turnaway Study, where they not only um, researched and interviewed women who obtained an abortion, they also talked to women who were turned away um, from clinics because they had reached the gestational limit. And understanding the outcomes for women who do and do not attain, obtain abortions is incredibly important for thinking about some of the broader impacts uh, that the ruling is likely to have moving forward. Now, among uh, women who were able to obtain an abortion, most of them felt like, overwhelmingly felt like they'd made the right decision and felt relatively secure with the decision that they'd made. 
They also found some uh, differences in terms of contraceptive use. Um, women who were able to obtain an abortion were more likely to use contraception, uh, like um, condoms and short-term short -term hormonal treatment uh, moving forward, and were not more likely to have an unintended pregnancy later on than women who were turned away. Uh, when it comes to relationships, right, remember one of the things I mentioned is that um, concern about one's partnership or relationships uh, was a commonly cited reason. Uh, women who were able to obtain an abortion were more likely to report being in a good relationship down the road um, and had better relationship circumstances and felt more sort of socially supported in that regard. Um, unfortunately, women who were unable to obtain abortions were more likely to remain involved with partners that they uh, cited as being abusive um, and remained in those circumstances. When it comes to economic outcomes, um, for among women who were able to obtain abortions, um, their educational goals were more likely to be achieved. They were more likely to um, have sort of a short and long-term plan, uh, particularly a positive one-year plan. Among women who were not able to, uh, they noted a significantly higher chance that the family would fall below the federal poverty line. Um, and in addition to income, uh, may also have more debt, lower credit scores, worse financial security, and were less able to afford uh, family necessities um, that were important for the household. Physical and mental health outcomes um, for women who were unable to obtain abortion included higher stress and anxiety, though they did note that those symptoms tended to level out over time, um, but they did note higher risk to physical health, including things like chronic pain and lower self-reported health and well-being. Um, and so when we think about these various outcomes, these are things that touch on a number of different circumstances that impact people's lives and well-being. And so even though this is a reflection um, of outcomes from people who were able to obtain abortions that they were seeking and those who were not, those outcomes from either sort of experience help us to understand some of the longer range um, impacts uh, that the uh, procedure has on people's lives and circumstances. So I won't be labor because I want to make sure we definitely have some time for some questions and for Kate to talk a little bit about some action items. I won't talk too much about uh, the changes that we've seen. Uh, Professor Rosler also, uh, you know, connected to that as well. So when it comes to what's next, thinking a bit about some of those causes and consequences that I talked a little bit about are going to be incredibly important. Um, when it comes to more uh, personal and institutional outcomes, um, we may see higher birth rates, uh, particularly among younger women, unless there are changes uh, with regards to abortion access. Um, we, when it comes to childhood poverty, the uh, current childhood poverty rate, or at least as of 2021, was about 5.2%. Um, and given uh, that women who were unable to obtain abortions were more likely to fall below the federal poverty line, have more difficulty um, meet, making ends meet and affording basic family uh, resources, needed resources, uh, we may see a changed family poverty rate. Um, I will not talk too much about the impacts to mental health and poor physical health too much because I think that my um, panelists have covered uh, those kinds of things well, but I will also point out um, that when it comes to uh, long-term uh, maternal and neonatal and childhood health, this is also something that is strongly tied to income. So circumstances uh, that make things more economically or financially precarious for people um, can also have long-term impact on maternal health for children that may be um, born up the road. Um, and the last thing is a little more anecdotal, and I recognize that the, the plural of anecdotes is not data, but it is something for us to be mindful of. Um, there is a noted uptick, especially when the decision initially leaked, of people uh, looking online for alternative means for abortion, looking up uh, different remedies, options, um, and as we are likely very well aware, social media has a lot of information and a good amount of it um, can be quite questionable anyway, let alone when it comes to someone's health. Uh, so as we continue to move forward, something of which we will need to be incredibly mindful is of the information um, that may abound in our various spaces, whether those are interpersonal or whether they are more online. 
um, some of which may pose some very serious risk uh, to people's health and well-being. All right. Hey, I kept it to 15. All right, Kate. I'm only a little bit taller than you. All right, so whether or not you want to make abortion available on demand at any time during a woman's pregnancy, having less access to abortion makes a lot of problems in our society that we already have worse and makes things difficult for children and for infants and for people who give birth. So I wanted to encourage you, yes, if you want to make sure that abortion access is legal, lobby your politicians on behalf of that. But if you're still concerned about child welfare or if you're concerned about supporting families, there are other issues you could also get engaged in. For example, sex education. If, we, if you have reliable, scientifically based sex education that discusses consent and um, also birth control measures, you're less likely to get pregnant teenagers. Um, and so that is something that is useful to have. Missouri does not require sex education in high school. It only requires HIV education. Um, and some schools offer much more limited education than others. Contraception. Um, you can lobby your state representatives to perfect, per, per, protect all forms of contraception, including the morning after pill, which some Missouri state legislatures have, have wanted to get rid of, or IUDs, which are long acting and protect people more. Because remembering to take a pill every day is a little bit more complicated than leaving an IUD in for several years. Um, and so contraception prevents conception, which prevents the need for abortion. So if you want to have fewer abortions, this is another way to protect people. And you yourself, if you're sexually active, may be possibly considering using two forms of, of, of um, in a heterosexual relationship, maybe consider having two forms of birth control for the time being. Or whether or not you are someone who can get pregnant, stocking up from Walgreens, Walmart, or Amazon on the morning after pill, which, um, is fat better, works better if you have access to it right away. Although do keep an eye on effectiveness. If you're over 155 pounds, it's slightly less effective. If you're over 176 pounds, it's minimally effective, but possibly still worth taking just in case. Healthcare reform. If you're a poor person who gets pregnant out, uh, unexpectedly, it's very difficult to find a Medicaid, a doctor who ha takes Medicaid. And we know a lot of health outcomes involve having pre good prenatal care or any prenatal care. So maybe encouraging changes in Medicaid, encouraging changes in health care, making universal health care available will make m there be more healthy babies and healthy parents. Um, perhaps lo um, m lobbying Missouri state reps to expand Medicaid and to require OBGYN doctors to accept Medicaid patients. Missouri is 42 out of 50. There are only eight worse states that have worse maternal mortality rates than us. And those rates are worse during, uh, um, in populations of women of color. So there are lots of issues we can work on with making healthcare um, take better care of pregnant patients. It's, it's the, the, we're the worst country um, or, or one of the worst, we have some of the worst maternity outcomes um, after childbirth and also for infants too. Um, and it's, 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 we should not. We have a great healthcare knowledge and doctors. I'm not sure we have a great healthcare system and I think that's part of the problem. Parental leave. You are not required by, your employer is not required to give you any paid leave, whether you're giving birth to a child, adopting a child, or your partner is giving birth to a child. Um, there's only unpaid leave available. And children are expensive. Not everyone can afford, especially if they have an unplanned pregnancy, to, ha to take parental leave. And childcare is incredibly expensive, especially for newborns. Um, so perhaps we should work on more universal pre preschool, some more daycare issues, um, parental leave issues, um, political reforms. If you um, can't vote, if, you're, if your districts are gerrymandered, your representative may lo not listen to you when you lobby for them. So even, even though it's not explicitly reproductive health care, having um, proper... Ki proper um, districts put together is a useful thing to have so that they will listen to you. Advocate for campaign finance reform so that you as a voter have more of a voice than a rich person who doesn't like birth control or sex education or health care. Um, advocate for possibly ranked choice voting or other elections that can make them more competitive. Go to vote in every election. 
research the candidates and their positions on these issues. See whether or not they align with your values. Educate yourself so that you can discuss these things um, with other people and possibly encourage them to think about them differently. Um, if you can become pregnant, find out if your doctor is supportive of abortion rights and reproductive rights and what hospital systems they admit to so that you know um, that they might be an advocate in case of your need. Even if you aren't someone who thinks that you want to get an abortion, you may need a doctor who will help you get that abortion if you have an ectopic pregnancy that it's likely to kill you. Um, so there are a lot of good things that you can do to plan ahead and possibly locate a doctor or hospital in Illinois where abortion is still legal that you can uh, develop a relationship with. Um, affordable, high quality childcare, universal health care, the living wage, um, people are more likely to decide to have children that they didn't plan if they have a living wage. And, a com and it, all of these things connect back to um, having um, happy, healthy families. So consider, even if you do not want to have um, wide abortion access, I think most of us have one of these issues that we would support and would help more people either not get pregnant or would help more people be able to make the choice they want to. Um, in some cases, some of those women in the turnaway study who can't afford another child would really like to have a child, but they're in a system where we don't have a lot of parental support, um, and some of that would be very useful. So think about getting active. At the very least, make sure you can vote. We have a few minutes left. Do we have comments or questions for our panelists? Thank you, all three, for a, a really rigorous academic exercise. Anybody, raise your hand high. <laughs> well. A good thing this isn't a controversial topic. Yeah. So. Oh, like four minutes. If you go and watch it afterwards, I can I can play it afterwards if you want. Um, how do you approach someone that takes the religious stance to talk about abortion? Like, if you're talking to someone that they're coming at it, saying that it's murder and stuff. Like, how do you have a civil conversation? I know you probably can't, but um, like, what's a good way to approach that? I can, I'm, yeah, I'm willing to sort of jump on that one. Um, I think one of the things that we can emphasize is that um, I think we collectively value having a healthy society, right? And so even though when it comes down to the actual issue itself, you know, there can be some ideological differences, I think. Um, that one starting point is emphasizing um, the best interests of people's collective health, right? So even with some of the stuff that me and Kate mentioned, you know, knowing why it happens and some other broader things that we can do, regardless of where someone may actually fall on the for specific specific to the issue of a abor of abortion, there is still something to be sort of pursued when it comes to trying to ensure better health outcomes for, for all of us and better economic outcomes and so on. So I think that that could at least be a starting point even if it's not a conversation that might yield someone changing their mind. There's still some progress to be made. Yeah, and, and you know what's fun about poli-sci is that there's often no right answer. It's a question of what you value more, whether you value you know the in, you know, women's autonomy, bodily autonomy, or you value the, you know if you think it's a life. Where my family is half half. Where we always have great uh, Thanksgivings used to be and Christmas used to be have so much fun arguing at the at the, at the Thanksgiving table and Christmas table. Um, all my relatives are like, how, how do you guys do this? But you, know, you just got to respect each other, and it's okay. Disagree is fun. It's fun to disagree. But but hey, what do you value more? That's kind of how I focus, and that's kind of what as my approach to politics is. What do you care about? How does that relationship work? Is this something where you think you can engage them on the core issue of abortion, or can maybe you have a discussion with them about making sure that the foster system, foster care system is fully funded in Missouri, or making sure that um, prenatal health care is supported? Like there are 
kind of edge issues that you can start discussions about that might speak to the values that you share and that maybe as they get into those, think about those over time, you might be able to build bridges. What do you guys think about the fact that the US military, all branches have regulations against homosexual sex, but not just that. Any sex that is not missionary is federally illegal, and if you get caught in the act, you can and will be punished. And if you participate in homosexual behaviors in the military, obviously you get discharged dishonorably. Of course. So I served from 2014 to 2018 in the U.S. Navy. There is no regulations against homosexuality anymore. That's, huh? Yeah. It's been gone since the Obama administration. Yeah. Yep. And then we, for a while, there was a don't ask, don't tell, which was a complete disaster in the military, and, and then they just repealed it, so. Hello. So um, one of the uh, specific cases that was mentioned was the, the lady in the army who, uh, at the time, the law was to have an abortion. Me, myself, I like to think I'm pro-choice, but my immediate thought uh, to that case was that is murder. And I, I noticed that. And I, which, which case was it again? The, uh, the, the, the army. Um, Susan Strecker. Yes. I, I forgot the specific name. But my, my thought is how would I argue a pro-choice view when my own first thought was that's murder uh, in the case oh, of she abortion. wanted to have a baby how is that murder well i, I don't know i just feel <laughs> i i she wanted to give birth i feel like someone smart enough could could twist it in a way i just like if somebody were to were to bring up that uh it's murder in that case i i don't see why they could argue that it's not murder in every case and i really i don't know what to say against that being someone who's pro-choice. I mean, pro-choice, uh, pro yeah. Oh, you're saying the military oh. wanted to force the force the force a murder. I mean, that's well, that's really what it come boils down to is is what what is your what is your stance on that issue? Where you know, and different religions have different points of view. I think um, was it you that mentioned about different religions? Yeah, the quickening and, 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 and Jews typically have a, a different, and Muslims have a different definition of when, when uh, life begins. And so yeah. there's just different definitions. So it's often a religious moral value. And different people have different values on that. And that's okay. We're out of time. I want to thank everyone for attending, for your great questions, and thank you all for this excellent presentation. Thank you.